Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Patrick O'Brien. I'm senior lecturer at Oxford Brookes University. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about disentangling the formal and the informal in judicial conduct processes. And really what I'm looking at here is the distinction between formal and informal and obviously specifically focusing on the informal avenue for complaints under the 2019 Act. Before we dive into the detail, I want to talk about what I'll call the discipline management spectrum. And really what I'm trying to get across here is that we can have multiple kinds of responses to the same problem. If we take, for example, a judge who is demonstrating some form of misconduct in their, in their tenure in office, um, let's take the example of a judge who has significantly delayed writing her judgments. She seems to be having difficulties um, reaching decisions in cases. She may be overtly rude to litigants and to witnesses. And we could think of multiple ways of responding to this kind of problem. We can have a formal disciplinary response um, where an investigation is initiated or a complaint is made and this gets channeled under the process of the 2019 Act to a panel uh, for formal investigation. We then have informal disciplinary processes, which look a lot more like, um, it, well, before the 2019 Act, like someone has a chat, um, perhaps there's a suggestion that the judge might like to take a step back, either temporarily or permanently, might like to consider some form of training of some kind. Again, all of this is voluntary um, in, the, in the previous regime, um, but there are the, the new regime creates this in a different way. We can also have a management response, which looks a lot like the informal response. Um, the management response perhaps takes more account of the career of the judge, the person of the judge, uh, and thinking about ways to respond to that problem that aren't necessarily disciplinary. And then finally, we have a welfare response. What's, what's wrong with the judge? What has caused this change in behaviour? Is something wrong at home? Perhaps there's an illness, perhaps there's been a bereavement, uh, perhaps there's a mental health issue. Now, all of these different responses could be made to the same problem. And, and I think that's part of, um, I think there's, there's a great opportunity um, when we have informal processes, particularly something like we have under the new Act. We have them sort of semi-formalised. Um, but there's also a risk that we end up um, treating something that may be actually a welfare issue as uh, something that is very formal and is responded to in, a, in a, perhaps in an excessive way. After the Act, after the Judicial Council Act 2019, under the new process that will come into being, informal discipline will take two forms. Firstly, we have what we could call informal informal behaviour, um, if there's a bit of a clumsy term, but it will do. So here we have social managerial pressure by senior judges on conduct on the judge. Um, this could amount to very trivial things, having a conversation, having a cup of tea, suggesting a step back, as I suggested, or it may be suggesting that someone should resign, that they, they've, they've got to the end of the road here, they need to take a step back, they're not able to do the job anymore. And then on the other hand, we have the new process under the Judicial Council Act, and this is what we could call formal informal. It's quite structured, um, there's a formal way into it, um, and it has requirements which I will go into in a moment. And these two approaches to informal discipline are not um, mutually exclusive. They also, and I think this is important, they also won't necessarily depend on the seriousness of the issue. As we saw in the case of my example I gave a moment ago, a judge who is um, having serious problems, perhaps mental health problems, might be asked to resign, might be the subject of a complaint. Um, so this could take in, be taken extremely seriously when perhaps it might be a welfare issue. Um, and again, I'm not trying to suggest that one path necessarily is right or wrong, but I think it's important to recognise that this isn't necessarily that the, the informal is for trivial and that the formal is for the very serious. It's, that's not quite the way this plays out. What do informal processes tend to look like? Well, this is actually quite a difficult question to answer because the nature of informal disciplinary processes and this kind of response to judges who evince 
uh, behavioral difficulties or conduct in office difficulties is that they're, they're below the radar. The point of doing something informally is that it doesn't create a public record. Um, what we do know is that it, it does tend to be reserved for low-level issues, conduct issues, performance issues, perhaps being rude to witnesses or litigants, taking too long to produce judgments, that kind of thing. Um, there's a, a rare public example from England and Wales in the last few years, a judge called Patricia Lynch uh, used the C word in court um, to describe a defendant who had just described her in similar terms. And the response to this, which was published, was that this was not regarded as a matter of misconduct as such, but it was dealt with by informal advice. And the, the quoted portion is to re re respond appropriately to parties in court at all times, and who would disagree with that? Um, and this is typical of the kind of outcomes we see. We get advice um, to change practice, to train, an apology. Apologies are often very important. Agreement to do things in a different way, perhaps to not take on this particular kind of case again in future. Um, it can just amount to a quick word over tea. One judge I spoke to who had a huge number of complaints from a single litigant um, something like 30 complaints told me that 28 of them had been dismissed two of them were left in place and the presiding judge in charge of, of this judge was asked to uh, have a quick word with them so um, the presiding judge invited him to his chambers said Let, let's have a, a word over tea um, came to the chambers cup of tea this is me having a word with you no more was said um, so there's also a uh, scope for um, management responses to the way that the, the, the problems are phrased and the way that the outcomes are framed. Um, and there's a lot of discretion there in, in an informal resolution process. Let's move on now to look at the 2019 Act process itself. Um, to get to an informal resolution of a dispute under the new process, um, we have to go through a number of stages. I've tried to represent this um, as clearly as possible here, but I realise it's still a little bit convoluted. Um, what I haven't included is the initial decision about admissibility. Once we have passed that threshold, we get to um, a decision by the Judicial Conduct Committee on whether this should be a formal or an informal um, process. If the committee believes this is suited to informal resolution, it will be sent to a designated judge. If not, the committee is obliged, it must, according to the Act, refer the matter to a panel. We then have a consent stage, although there's a question mark over this, which I'll deal with in a moment. If both parties consent to informal resolution, the designated judge can then go forward and attempt this. If consent is refused, the designated judge has to write a report to the committee explaining what has happened, and the JCC then has the option, they may refer it, to the panel. Um, so obviously there's an important distinction here between must and may and we'll explore that again in a moment. If resolution fails we get the same path again. There's a report back to the committee explaining why and again the committee may choose to refer it on to a, to a panel for formal resolution. Finally then if we have a successful resolution that is the end of the matter. There will be a report to the committee which will take note of it and the statute says very clearly and very specifically that the, the committee shall take no further action. So once we have a successful um, informal resolution process, the statute says that no further action can be taken. Now, there are some ambiguities in this process. They mainly relate to the requirement of consent to informal resolution. Um, if the... This, their consent is taken before the matter is referred to the designated judge. It looks like the committee will be obliged to refer the matter to a panel. If consent is taken after the referral, then the committee retains the option um, to choose not to refer it on. Now, this seems to me to be problematic because the kinds of cases that are likely to be regarded as suited to informal resolution under the Act itself are going to be the lower level issues. And it, it seems to me that it would be problematic if um, the complainant 
uh, let, let's say they've unreasonably uh, refused consent to an informal resolution, is then able to force this into the formal uh, disciplinary track. Um, so essentially what happens here, section 62, which is the consent requirement for informal resolution, is silent on when this consent would actually be taken. Um, as I say, if, if it gets past the designated judge, then we have, a, this gets uh, pushed back to section 60, uh, subsection 1, which creates the obligation to refer. Um, we then have the, the other alternative, which is that the designated judge asks them if they consent. If this happens, we're not really that clear. Um, it looks like the most likely option would be that this would be covered by section 63, uh, subsection 4, um, so that this would be regarded as an unsuccessful attempt at informal resolution. So let's suppose that uh, the matter goes to the designated judge, the designated judge takes uh, consent, one or other party, the complainant and or the judge, refuses consent. This then gets bounced back to the committee uh, for decision. They then have the option to refer to the panel or not. Um, we then have a further stage, and, and as far as I can see, and I welcome correction on this if, if I've missed something, um, it's not clear whether informal resolution to be successful under the Act requires the consent of both parties. Um, does an informal resolution require buy-in by the complainant? Let's say that the judge has offered an apology for whatever the behaviour was, and the complainant simply hasn't accepted this, and the designated judge regards this as successful because the judge made the apology anyway and the complaint has just refused to accept it. We end up in a sort of an ambiguous situation there. Um, and we'll, we'll, let's, let's think about what this actually means for the nature of informal resolution. Well, as far as I can see it, all of these consent requirements make the informal process under the Act resemble mediation effectively. It's not quite mediation, but it's a structured form of complaint process that looks like uh, mediation. Um, especially consent requirement at the end, uh, sorry, at the, at the beginning, um, uh, um, seems, to, seems to match this, this kind of expectation. This being the case, if the statute is unclear about whether or not consent should happen before or after referral to the designated judge, it seems to me that the best option is to do it after. Uh, because this allows for the Judicial Conduct Committee to consider whether consent has been refused unreasonably by either the complainant or the judge. And obviously, in these circumstances, it seems more likely that the complainant would be the one who'd be refusing consent. Uh, it seems seems logical that there, there might be an incentive on the part of the judge for this to be consented to and dealt with informally and quickly. Um, all of this may become clear um, when the Judicial Council issues its uh, expected draft guidelines on informal resolution. Um, but if these haven't been completed yet, my strong advice would be to make designated judge uh, the designated judge take the consent, so to avoid uh, complaints that wouldn't be suited to a formal inquiry or would be too low level, too trivial, um, being forced down that route by the way that the uh, Section 60 has been drafted. And building on this, and this, coming back to my spectrum again, we need to balance two issues here. We need to balance the trust of judges with um, the important issue of accountability to the, pub to the public. Some judges I spoke to in England and Wales complained of a star chamber when it came to discipline, with too much focus being uh, given, too much weight being given to relatively trivial complaints. Um, I'm not in a position to evaluate whether um, these complaints were, were actually valid. Um, and in fact, it's very, very difficult to find uh, these kind of background details about the complaints process. Um, but certainly it seems that it's important to avoid the impression that how seriously um, or the severity of a response to a complaint uh, or a disciplinary issue depends on whether a member of the public actually complains about it. Um, so we, we could foresee a sort of a, uh, a negative uh, structuring of the complaints process where all the attention goes to the issues that get complained about and the most serious issues are left uncomplained about and so remain undealt with. And I think to get a judicial buy-in, um, it needs to be seen to be fair in that sense. Uh, and so we need to take into account the whole spectrum 
are of this this idea between discipline and management and all these blended issues, uh, particularly welfare issues, because often these go um, unseen in the background uh, and, and they, they often explain quite a lot of sudden misbehaviour. Um, so to conclude, uh, I think informal resolution is a good thing and we need more of it and I welcome the fact that the new Act will allow for more of it in a structured way. It's the most effective way of resolving problems. We know that from general life, but also fr from uh, evidence we have about judicial discipline, um, particularly in the US. The evidence from the US uh, also suggests that informal discipline becomes more prevalent, actually, and more effective once we have formal structures in place. Because judges with management responsibilities are able to use a sort of a carrot and stick approach. We have the carrot of the disciplinary process of the fact that an issue might become public, the professional embarrassment and so on. To, uh, so, sorry, the stick, not the carrot, the stick of those things to use uh, and then the carrot of avoiding those things uh, to encourage judges who might be in difficulty in some way or behaving badly to improve their behaviour, um, to uh, take on training, to limit their practice, perhaps to go part-time. Um, we also need to be aware of the fact that informal processes will take place outside of the Act. People will still have conversations uh, with colleagues and peers. Uh, professional norms will, st will still be very important. Uh, good management responses, welfare responses outside the context of the Act will also remain important. and We need to remain uh, alive to that as well. And the final warning I, I would raise regard is, is regarding this consent requirement uh, in the Act. It may create a barrier to the effective informal resolution of complaints if it isn't handled um, in a sensitive way, and I, I hope that it will be. Thank you. That's it from me, and I look forward to any questions.